Kia ora everybody. Uh, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Um, good evening everyone. Um, on behalf of the Auckland Conversations team, um, a, a warm, warm welcome to you to this evening's Auckland Conversations. Um, my name is Ludo Campbell-Reed and I am the design champion for Auckland. I'm also the Auckland Design Office's uh, general manager and uh, I'm also the proud sponsor of the Auckland Conversations series and um, of which we are here tonight. Uh, tonight's event is going to be live streamed again, so for those of you joining us, <laughs> it seems odd, um, from around the world um, and around New Zealand and around Auckland, uh, I bid you a, a warm welcome. I um, want to also make a particular thanks to our colleagues um, who are our sign language interpreters tonight. And, uh, We've noticed an opportunity here to tell a much wider story in a much more authentic way, and uh, we believe this is a uh, part of solving that opportunity. Um, I just before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the New Zealand Green Building Council, who are part of um, tonight's, um, who are part of the World Green Building Week, and also the New Zealand Institute of Architects, who are organisers of the Auckland Architecture Week, which is on uh, this week, and they've been helping us and working on tonight's programme. Um, I'd like to thank our partner sponsors, Rosine and, and Gib, Jib. Um, they've been with us for some time now and are uh, really grateful for their generous support. So I wouldn't, I'd like to ask you if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together for Rosine and Jib. Thank you. I'd also like to particularly thank the, our program sponsors. We've got a lot of them, and uh, it, just shows, it just shows that the, the depth and breadth of the support for uh, the program and what we're trying to achieve here. So I'd like to thank Brookfield Lawyers, um, Boffa Miskell, Architectural Designers New Zealand, MR Cagney, New Zealand Institute of Architects, the New Zealand Planning Institute, and the New Zealand Green Building Council. So there's a whole range of people from all walks of life and disciplines there, and uh, really grateful to the teams uh, for uh, their support. Um, so to tonight, um, we're presenting quite a few interesting eclectic themes this evening. Um, so we're gonna try to bring them together under one common banner. Uh, but we've got a whole range of things we'd like to talk to you about tonight. So um, we hope that that provides you with a really stimulating sort of um, uh, genesis of a range of issues to discuss. Um, it's the World Green Building Week, um, uh, started in 2009, uh, which was created to create a much more connected and more interactive and a more public conversation around the role the buildings can play in creating a more sustainable future, a more sustainable society. Tonight's talk, um, later on in the session, will focus on a real example of putting those words into actions and the sort of thoughts into, into reality. And I think that's one of the key things about this, um, you know, really starting to mainstream sustainability in our everyday practices. And it's really useful looking at projects such as we'll be discussing later and seeing, you know, how can we imply that to Auckland? Uh, because it's important to ask ourselves, what are, what are we doing in this space? Um, Part of tonight's talk has also um, occurs as part of the Auckland um, Architecture Week. I've got a very cool um, flyer here from the team. So Auckland Architecture Week is, is happening um, in Auckland uh, this week. Uh, we're, we're sort of part of the way through. Um, as many of you know, it sort of happens for a week, as, as the, the name describes, which means up until Sunday. So we've got uh, plenty of design and architecture-related events in which you can participate in, uh, mostly for free. There are some paid events, but um, primarily it's an open thing for the public. Um, tomorrow night, for instance, there's a bungalow event and um, organised by the Albert Eden Local Board and uh, where you can see an entertaining lineup of speakers um, who will discuss ways you can modernise a bungalow uh, without it losing its mojo. So that, I, I, I'll probably go along to that. I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. Um, Friday night has a Pecha Kucha evening at the museum, so a night at the museum, which will be a great way to catch up on uh, some of what's been going on in terms of Auckland's most creative people, um, in terms of what they've been getting up to. And across the weekend, there are a whole range of you know, really cool events taking place, place at um, AUT's uh, Sir Paul Reeves building, which is a, a really fantastic facility. There's really too many to mention, really, but in fact, the whole week program um, can be viewed on the, um, on the website. So for those of you that uh, would like to, to, to um, attend, 
www.architectureweek.co.nz. So that's www.architectureweek.co.nz. Um, Auckland Architecture Week is brought to you by the Auckland branch of the New Zealand Institute of Architects, and uh, they would like to particularly thank their sponsors for this year, which is AUT University, Jib, Rosine, and the Warren Trust. So um, would you all mind putting your hands together to support their sponsors? <laughs> is that OK? <laughs> I've got the, uh, the leaders down here looking at me, eyeballing me, making sure we get this out. But there's a real opportunity to um, get people along. And I think it's about build, building architecture is much more the mainstream of the conversation. So I think that's really what we're trying to do. So demystifying what it is and what it isn't. So that's great. So um, in terms of uh, other projects tonight, um, in terms of, um, in conjunction with the Green Buildings Council, um, we're also really thrilled to launch a, uh, a new component of the Auckland Design Manual, uh, which is the um, ADM. It's a, a sort of e-based electronic um, one-stop shop for all design guidance for all of Auckland. Um, we're really pleased to la and, uh, launch tonight the launch of the Sustainable Design Hub, um, which has um, gone live today. Uh, we've basically pulled all our sustainability guidance together in one place, you know, just trying to make it much more easy for the public and for our customers to get to one place. Um, a bit like the unitary plan, which is the process is underway, building a sort of a, a one plan for Auckland based on 14 or 15 separate plans that used to exist, and that process is underway. Um, really, at the end of the day, that's all about customer service and, and clarity and consistency, because too many rules, too many different types of plans, you know, how on earth do the public and the private sector engage with us? So we've pulled all our sustainability to guidance in one place and a new home for it. We've worked with the sustainability organisations such as Beacon and with also with the Green Building Council, of course, um, to really integrate with their resources so that the three or four, you know, it becomes a tripartite of, of energy. Um, we're also building a gateway for sustainable design tools um, for New Zealand businesses and individuals so that that gives everybody a, a repertoire and also a, a resume and a, a package of things which they can uh, give them better advice to lift their awareness, um, creating case studies and so forth. And um, I don't know if you've all met him yet, but there's a chap called John Morrow who's the new um, Chief Sustainability Officer for Auckland Council, a uh, really fabulous guy, and he and his team have been helping my team um, embed best practice in sustainability into all the plans and the programs that we're underway. So there's a real um, sort of momentum and mojo building. And so for those of you that want to look at the Auckland Design Manual webpage, um, it's www.aucklanddesignmanual.co.nz. That's aucklanddesignmanual.co.nz. So, last two issues to cover before I get off the stage um, and introduce my, the next speaker, which is going to be Vernon Tarver. Uh, Vernon is, the, um, is one of the members of the Watamata Local Board, and Vernon has a portfolio responsibility for urban design and heritage, so he'll be talking to you a little bit about the, um, the Aotea um, Square and the Aotea Quarter Framework Plan, which is currently under a public consultation at the moment. And uh, we sit within a building that's part of this new central um, Aotea precinct. And there's lots of exciting plans for that. So that's out to consultation. And uh, Vernon will be taking you through some of the key pieces of that. And there's a whole team of people here who are here to support you, uh, to, to build and to um, sort of enrol your support and also your ideas in terms of that program. Uh, but before I introduce Vernon, um, I, just, I just wanted to touch upon a program which is um, underway, not completed. Um, in 2010, I commissioned uh, Jan Gell uh, from Copenhagen to come to Auckland to undertake uh, what we are calling a public life survey, which is really a survey, um, instead of counting cars and, and simply doing that, we're, we're counting people, but we're also observing what people do. Because I've always said that, you know, before we become planners, we should be psychologists. Because at the end of the day, understanding cities is about understanding people. And if you don't understand people, how on earth can you work in that space? And so understanding that link between planning and psychology is really, really critical. And Jan Gell's team in Copenhagen have developed up a, a tool to assess the quality of public life in Auckland. And with that, it starts to give us and the urban design teams and, the, and those teams within Auckland Transport 
the, the ammunition to make the right decisions based on real quantitative and qualitative judgments around how people interact with each other. Um, we commissioned a report in 2010, and the plan is to do one every five years. Um, so for the next 20 years, hopefully, uh, the, the organisation will undertake these surveys. Uh, we commissioned him back in 2010, and we have just run a second public life survey. Um, what we're doing this time is we're actually going to be doing um, a, a public survey in winter as well as a, a survey in summer. So we've undertaken the winter survey, which was done two months ago, and we will be doing another survey with help of a whole range of volunteer, an army of volunteers from the universities and tertiary educations, councillors who came along, local board members, and members of the public to be participating in that. And uh, there's some really fascinating findings, and it helps us to, again, um, understand how best to respond in a planning and urban design sense. And uh, part of that survey was undertaken around the Aotea precinct area. And um, it's just really interesting. One of the findings, for instance, in the last five years, we have a 145% increase in pedestrian uh, and stationary activities within the Aotea framework since five years ago. So there's a lot more happening, a lot more people are coming to the area, but understanding what they are doing and, and how they're integrating and operating with the city is absolutely key. So that will form the underpinning of the planning of the Aotea framework. So. Um, there's a lot to talk about in Auckland at the moment. There's a lot going on. Um, it's quite extraordinary and um, hard to keep up sometimes. Every day there's something different. And um, you know, it's just a really real privilege to do the job I do with my team. And um, there's a lot going on. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Vernon to come up to the stage. Uh, Vernon's going to, as I said, outline um, some key components of the AOTF framework and the consultation thereof. So uh, would you put your hands together for Vernon Tava? Sorry, that's not so long. No, 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 no. Sorry. Um, I must say it's a real privilege to be an elected member for the Waitamata local board area. We represent the city centre and the surrounding inner city suburbs. And in a time of explosive growth and development, as we're seeing now, uh, massive shifts in, in demographics and, and, and what parts of the city are used for what, it is indeed a very, very exciting time to be involved. And this is one of the more exciting uh, plans and frameworks that we're working on for the Aotea quarter. Now, obviously, we're sitting right in the middle of it, um, and there are the big charismatic parts of it, like the Town Hall, um, Aotea Centre, Aotea Square. Those are the obvious ones. But in fact, um, as of 2012, the um, Aotea quarter was actually expanded uh, to a much wider area of about 42 hectares, which includes um, from the top of Myers Park, along the Hobson Street Ridge Line, mid-block between Wellesley and Victoria Streets, and includes much of AUT, and the previously forgotten, and soon to be thrillingly revived, uh, spaces along Airedale and White Streets. So those are the ones out the back of those very steep streets out the back of Real Groovy. Um, so we're seeing huge shifts in terms of, of, of what this central part of the city is being used for. Uh, from um, being very much the commercial centre. Um, a lot of that is now moving down to the waterfront, to the Wynyard Quarter, and we're seeing a, a massive flow of, of residential movement into the central city. So, um, and as um, Ludo also touched on, you know, we're seeing a really dramatic change from a city that remains designed almost exclusively for cars, from being one that was used almost entirely by cars, to one that is very much becoming a place that we are wanting to make better and safer for people who are walking, people on bikes, people who are doing things other than cars. And as you'll see as I go through some of the earlier iterations of this area, you will see the comprehensive um, and sometimes very destructive influence of the private motor car. Uh, so, you always have to start with the historic shot. So as of even 1850, uh, you could see that the area was uh, pretty well developed. Um, this is looking east from, for the times, this is looking <laughs> northeast from the gully between Queen Street and Grey Street, which is now um, Myers Park. Um, so, you know, uh, since then, always an area of quite rapid change. This is looking at Albert Street, um, facing towards the uh, then quite new Civic Administration building, would have been only about 
you know, five or six years old then. But you see there's a really strong, coherent streetscape that was there and one that has been, you know, largely swept away since then. And of course, this is all pre Merrill Drive, which had an effect in the central city, not unlike the sort of massive disjunction that was caused by the city rail link. Um, pardon me, <laughs> by the, which is underground, don't forget, by the central motorway junction, that other three letter acronym that begins with three, with C. So um, Aotea was a huge disruptor of the space, and not in the cool technological buzzword sense of the word, but as in a massive digging up of what was a co reasonably coherent area. Um, and, and we are still dealing with a lot of the effects of that. Um, interestingly, I learned recently that Tibor Donna, the um, quite visionary in many aspects, um, chief council architect, uh, one of his schemes, or a couple of the schemes actually included the removal of the town hall because it wasn't a sufficiently clean, modernist building to fit in. And fortunately, common sense prevailed, but it didn't always. Some terrible mistakes were made. As late as 1989, the Salvation Army Hall was demolished, and to this day it remains a car park. And you'll see there's a bit of a common denominator here um, where we are fitting in car parks wherever possible, and of course these are areas that are still being um, you know, designed very much as through Merrill Drive there, we've got something of a mini motorway running across those other um, mini and almost major motorways of, of Nelson and Hobson Street where there's also a whole other very exciting stream of work going on. So uh, you'll notice that we're looking at, you know, what is there now. Um, I've got a couple of tantalising images of, of some future possibilities, but, but the point of this presentation is to, is to just have a look at around some of these areas that you might not have seen for a while that are there and get you excited about the possibilities of submitting um, and participating in this, um, in this survey and this consultation because it ends on the, on the 22nd. Um, you've uh, got the, uh, the handouts there on your uh, seats, so please encourage anyone you know um, to take part in that because if informed interested people who turn up to things like this aren't participating then who will so please tell a friend um, but what we're seeing here is some really poor connections um, particularly across Merrill Drive which is that real disjunction there um, and behind Town Hall you know we have a temporary car park that has been a temporary car park for the last 26 years um, but there's a lot of work that's been done by the local board. Millions of dollars have been spent, in fact, on um, improving and renovating Myers Park. Uh, and we've got some really exciting plans that are uh, taking place um, later next year uh, to redo the underpass, the currently quite sort of uh, East Berlin looking um, sort of underpass that we have there, which is going to be very significantly redone, lit up, made a much safer and more pleasant place, which will be part of opening up this whole quarter because a thing that you'll notice is that in many senses all the roads are leading to all the roads are leading to um, here I'll skip a couple ahead because here's a great example of where we see that a lot of the roads are leading to this area but it just hasn't been quite finished off a lot of those essential connections haven't been made so that's a very big part of what we're planning to do and hoping to do here so skipping back to, this is Airedale Street. So, so this is actually one of the most rapidly growing uh, residential parts of the central city. Um, we know that we can do much, much better than this. Um, inner city residents, the numbers have tripled to 30,000 in just the last 12 years. Um, and we know between um, the, the last two censuses that, uh, or sensei, that about um, 7,000 people have moved in in that time. So we're seeing a really rapid movement of people into the city and we want to make it a much friendlier place um, and a much more pleasant place for people to live and play and enjoy. Um, just another picture there around the back of the um, central administration building. Poor connections, dead ends, and once more, just cramming in some car parks wherever we can possibly fit them. Uh, now this, at the moment, rather uninspiring vista, the car park um, out behind the Bledisloe building, is going to be the site of the Aotea station on the city rail link. Um, and the day it opens, it is going to be the busiest railway station in New Zealand. Um, and an ultimate vision here, one that I find quite inspiring, and I hope you will too, is the possibility that, that when we tie this area together and really get all these connections happening, that the combination of, of underground trains, heavy rail, the buses, uh, the light rail that we're looking at um, happening as a possibility, all roads, in a sense, will lead to the Aotea Quarter and the Aotea Square. And the hope will be, of course, the vision will be, that it won't just be a centre of the city, but a centre for the entire Auckland region. 
Now, there's a lot of really uh, massive development going on in the area. We're going to see a huge investment um, there at the uh, St James Theatre, um, which will be a 42-level building with 308 apartments. Um, so a huge amount of money flowing into the area and, of course, residents, many of whom won't be bringing cars with them. So they're looking for an amenable place, a pleasant place to uh, cycle and walk. We've got some beautiful architecture in the area, but, of course, just down the road is the City Mission. And what we see is a real... A, a, a quite dramatic break between what the place is like in the daytime and what it's like in the nighttime. Um, and it's very important that we deal with, with homelessness, with homeless people, that we don't just try to design them out and delete them from, uh, from the urban setting, but actually design in a way that uh, people who are homeless are designed in. So we have a lot of fine connections. We've got a, lovely, a lot of lovely tree-lined avenues, like Gray's Avenue, which you can see here. But you know, we know, once again, that we can do much, much better. Um, so this all looks a bit esoteric, of course. The best place to look at this is on the Shape Auckland site. We'll be getting to the link at the end. And of course, it's on those handouts that you've got. That is really worth having a look. I just had a look around earlier today. There are a couple of cool interactive um, segments of it. So there's an interactive map where you can actually get in there and click on spots and leave your own comments um, anywhere you like around um, where you think a crossing could be improved, what you think should go somewhere. So you can really have free reign in there on that interactive map. So that's also worth really looking at online and the links will be on the pages in front of you. So here is a suggestion. Now, this is highly conceptual, you know. Um, hopefully, the one thing that will stay will be the, um, the uh, central administration building, which we see there. Um, the expressions of interest are closing at, I believe, the end of this month, so um, pretty soon, and we'll see um, what kind of usages are proposed for that. Um, and, of course, the, the image of the building behind that and the one behind the town hall there are suggestions, are just ideas of the kind of thing that we might be seeing. And, of course, there's a very strong emphasis, though, on having a, a line of sight, um, you know, that you're looking right there, that we get a good, clear line of sight um, right through to Myers Park, of course. So we've got a really great connection right through there and we, and we actually connect um, the areas together there. Why Hotatiu Stream? which has its heads uh, near the top of uh, Myers Park, which runs right down under Queen Street. Um, of course, it's all uh, culverted in a, in a brick tunnel deep under Queen Street. There have been attempts to, uh, you know, reference, to, to bring hotter to you back to the surface, but of all the ideas and proposals, the most promising place, the most likely place we can do something about it is right at that square near the entrance to uh, Myers Park. So some really exciting possibilities in there and just an image to get you thinking um, and to, to pique your interest and your imagination. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, when you step out today, just have a look around, whichever way you're walking home, back to your car, public transport, whatever it is, have a look around, just have a, have a walk around. There's also a walking tour uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. under the clock tower. Is that right? Great. So 5 p.m. tomorrow under the clock tower, that'll be the last of the walking tours where you'll be taken around by some very knowledgeable people who will, um, who will point out the, uh, the things you need to see and give you some further food for thought. So, you know, please let your imagination run wild. Tell us whatever you want. Um, and, and I really, really look forward to seeing um, some of the thoughtful and considered feedback that I'll no doubt get from you. Thank you very much. That was, that was fabulous, just fabulous. Thank you, Vernon. What a great. Well, like, I think you can all see there's a real opportunity to. to uh, retrofit and to rebuild this place and um, I guess beware of those who tell you it'll be temporary you know and I think there's a there's a lesson here for Auckland um, you know do it once do it right rather than sort of procrastinate and um, we talk a lot about retrofitting here as well we'll, we'll, we'll sort of or we'll um, or future proof nothing never, never actually happens you know so let's do it once do it right um, and I guess that story around the heritage it's quite emotional isn't it I, I know I, was, I wasn't here but it must be the people behind me in the row were, were sort of all, you know, quite, quite mo you know, quite mobile with those photographs you were showing, you know. And I think, you know, we, we lost a lot of amazing buildings in a certain period. And I think it's really difficult to retrofit cities. 
Um, it's like salt in cooking. Once it's in, it's hard to kind of get it out. So, um, you know, I think that was a really great job. So, look, we really hope you all contribute and give us your thoughts. This is the centre of the region, uh, not just of the city centre. So, um, thank you, Vernon. That was brilliant. So, look, I'd, without further ado, I want to like to introduce, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Alex Cutler. Alex has been a, a, a friend, an ally, a, a champion around sustainability for for many, many years, and um, in fact, 20 years in the profession. Um, she's worked across the agencies, across the sectors, um, also did consulting work for PwC, and um, known her for some time. She's a fantastic lady, and um, we'd like to welcome to her stage to introduce our, our special guest tonight. So, Alex Cutler, everyone. Good evening, folks. So, as Ludo said, I'm Alex, and I'm from the New Zealand Green Building Council. Um, what many of you might not know is that the New Zealand Green Building Council is actually part of the World Green Building Council. We are one of about 100 green building councils, and there is one in each of those countries. And once a year, we have World Green Building Week. This, for us, is World Green Building Week. So you are in great company around the world. We're all celebrating sustainable buildings. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of Auckland Conversations. I'm quite looking forward to the panel later on, where you're going to ask lots of difficult questions. Um, but right now, it's my privilege to be able to introduce to you one of our long-standing members, Chris Day from Marshall Day Acoustics. There have been a long-standing member. I have to confess, though, that actually my relationship with Chris is a bit more recent. Does anybody go to Construction Rocks? Anybody heard of Construction Rocks? So there is a battle of the bands in the building and construction sector. And I happen to be one of the, member, uh, the judges on it. And it sort of serves my rock chick inner. And um, this year, Marshall Day Acoustics won it. And um, I've talked to Chris. And he has, I think he has a short clip later on to show you, which is quite exciting. So, so that's, how we, that's how we know each other. Um, and of course. It's perfect, because it fits him as a person uh, very clearly. So I want to tell you a couple of things about his background. So he was clearly ahead of his time. So Chris is an Australian, and he moved here in 1981. <laughs> so you're almost, well, you're kind of a Kiwi. Um, so he studied mechanical engineering at Monash University in Melbourne, and um, loved the music as well. So that kind of led him to acoustic design. Uh, it also led him to Harold Marshall, who's an architect, and they created Marshall Day Acoustics. Um, now, from my perspective as a sustainability, 20 years in the sustainability field, uh, I think that acoustics are actually really intrinsically linked to sustainability. They're paramount to the overall integrity of a project. They're the kind of thing that you really notice if it's bad or if it goes wrong. Um, it's the kind of thing, if it works right, it's entirely brilliant because it hushes you completely. So I think that acoustics are critical to everyday life. Uh, there's a lot of move to activity-based working in offices. Uh, and getting the acoustics right of those spaces is absolutely critical. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention was that, that real comfort, we think about comfort in a space quite often as being thermal comfort. Uh, sometimes we think of it as being visual comfort but actually it's also about acoustic comfort. Um, so it is a, it's a critical part. And as I said, if the building doesn't work from an acoustic perspective, then it very quickly becomes a place that people don't want to go to. So the reason that, that Chris is here tonight is he's going to tell you a bit about an amazing project that he's been working on for a very long time. So the contract for the Philharmonie de Paris was uh, seven years. Um, he won it seven years ago, uh, and it was on the back of quite a prodigious amount of work uh, in, in New Zealand and globally, actually. And hopefully you'll tell them a little bit about some of the global projects as well. But here in Auckland, Vector Arena, Eden Park, um, anybody involved in the Auckland Theatre Company, the, the new theatre that's going to be down in, in the waterfront. So that they, he and Marshall Day Acoustics have been involved in a lot of those great projects. Um, the project in Paris... From a sustainability perspective, it has been part of HQE is, is, an, uh, is an environmental organization in, in Paris, uh, or in France particularly, uh, and it's been part of their reframing of their 14 environmental targets. So the project has huge amounts of thermal insulation, it's got heat recovery systems, and it's going to have solar cells on it at some point. Um, 
I'm not going to tell you lots about the project because Chris is going to do that, um, but he is going to focus particularly on acoustic design. So it's my great privilege to introduce you to Chris Day. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex, for that kind in, uh, introduction. I, uh, I do feel with our microphones like this, it's uh, sort of Madonna and Justin Timberlake. We might have to do a little routine later on when I fire up the rock and roll music, but we'll leave that to later. Because um, time might be a critical factor. What, I, what I've done, or tried to do for this evening, is to cut down a talk that I've given a couple of times before, which took roughly an hour, into condense it into a, a half an hour. Um, we mightn't quite achieve that, but let's, let's see how we go. So, um, let's kick off. What, the Philharmonie de Paris, what, what is it? Uh, it's, based, it's primarily a 2,400 seat concert hall, and it also has two large rehearsal spaces, and smallest practice rooms and offices throughout the building. It's been the, the best and the worst project we've ever worked on. Um, the best um, because of the excitement of working with Jean Nouvel and creating a new typology in concert halls, which I'll explain a little further. It's been uh, uh, winning that competition as seven years ago, as it might actually almost be eight years ago, um, was in incredibly exciting. And of course, uh, the, the wonderful outcome in the end in terms of the uh, uh, wonderful reviews we've had of the acoustics. Uh, the worst because uh, it's been a financial disaster both for uh, the French government financially um, and all the consultants. We've uh, all uh, had huge overruns. Um, and also the project architect, uh, not Jean Nouvel, but the project architect was uh, somewhat difficult to work with. And um, it's been a roller coaster ride for eight years, I, I assure you. But um, luckily, it's finished on the top of the roller coaster. So, if we could um, jump onto the next slide. <coughs> So this is the building on the left. Uh, it's set in the uh, Parc de la, de la Villette in the northeast segment, the 19th arrondissement of Paris. And I'm going to run you through a little bit of the background to start off with. The, the client is the, the, a combina the client is called the Philharmonie de Paris. It's an organization that's been set up by the Ministry of Culture and the City of Paris. They funded the project uh, equally. And the history and the site are uh, integral to how this building came about and some of the su sustainability aspects to it. The, um, as I mentioned, it's out here in the, here's the centre of Paris and all the other key cultural facilities are located around here, the Louvre, the Pompidou Centre, um, Notre Dame, uh, Opera Garnier, Opera uh, Bastille, all tend to be in the centre here. What they decided um, 30 years ago, it's been in the planning for this concert hall. Uh, uh, Paris already had an existing concert hall that was very ordinary acoustically and architecturally called La Playelle. They had, as I mentioned, two opera theatres, um, an old and a new, and they decided they wanted to put the new concert hall out here and uh, try and reach out to more of the suburbs. The eastern suburbs are where uh, um, a lot of the uh, people interested in symphony music are located, and they decided to locate it here in the uh, Parc de Viette, which has an already existing uh, music precinct, which consists of the uh, Cité de la Musique, which is a small concert hall and an organ, organ recital room, and the Conservatoire de Musique, and which is their conservatory and music education facility. And this shows the park. It's located, as I showed on the map, right next to the Peripherique, which runs around, a circular around uh, Paris. And here we have the largest science, um, science and industry museum in Europe. And here we have an indoor, a temporary indoor stadium called the Zenith. Here's the Cité de la Musique, the Conservatoire, and the Le Grand Al. Um, it's the old site of the ab main abattoirs for Paris. So 
the idea of partly of, of putting it out here was to basically to bring um, music to the people and drag in people. It's a, it's a relatively poor area. It's, it's uh, Port de Pantin is the closest tube station, which you may recall was where the terrorists for Charlie Hebdo were, um, were living at the time. And uh, it has, as I'll explain later on, been highly successful in bringing the people to the music. So the Parc de la, v de la Viette is, was designed by Bernard Tumey, uh, I think roughly about 40 or 50 years ago. And it's got these follies, as he called them, all through the park. And here are some of the examples. And these are some of my photographs, and it's got these other sculptures and whatever all through the park. And uh, the buried bicycle, the zenith in the background. And, uh, and that then leads us on to the competition of how we got involved with this, this project. They were basically, once they decided to announce this, they drew up a, a, a huge brief and a huge amount of documentation, the French government. And 98 international teams of architects and structural engineers, mechanical engineers, acousticians, theatre consultants, each team had to have the full works, put their credentials forward to try to get onto a short list uh, of five to go into a design competition. We received a call out of the blue from Jean Nouvel saying, uh, would you like to be involved in our team uh, to go in this competition? And for those of you who don't know, as my colleague who answered the phone didn't know who Jean Nouvel was, he's the Pritzker Prize winning architect who's right up there in the top um, five star architects in the world with uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, Frank Geary, Norman Foster and all of those. So um, he's certainly the biggest name in France. So why did he choose Marshall Day? And um, a number of my colleagues suggested it might have been because our logo looked something like um, Shumi's Follies, but um, it turns out it wasn't. We, uh, the client's acoustician uh, was somebody who we'd known for a large number of years, and he knew of our international reputation and our ability to develop innovative designs. Um, a lot of acousticians stick with conventional designs that they know will work and they tell the architect how it should be. And Jean Nouvel had had some unfortunate experiences of that and so he headed down our route. The credentials had to be submitted by 26th of December in 2006 and there was 90 pages of government forms that we had to fill out, let alone um, our credentials. It was an amazing process. Anyway, on the 5th of January, we, uh, we were notified that we'd uh, made the shortlist. Our team had made the shortlist. And there were two other French architects involved, uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, one Austrian and one Dutch architect. So we were then in commenced a, a 10-week design competition phase. We had, as I mentioned, six teams. There was a 98-page architectural brief, and there was a 40-page acoustical brief. And we've never seen anything quite as detailed. We've worked with a number of projects that have had acoustical briefs, but never one that was so detailed. It specified, obviously, a large number of things, but the key things was, one, it had to be a surrounding seat layout. I, it wasn't to be a proscenium or a, a conventional um, shoebox hall. We had the stage up the front and the audience all facing the one way. It had to combine great clarity with high reverberance, normally conflicting requirements. You'll know in a cathedral it's got high reverberance but not great clarity. Uh, there were 10 objective criteria that were specified that we had to, had to achieve. It had to be adaptable for a large number of musical genres, including uh, jazz, rock, and world music, with a primary goal of symphony music. And finally, a really a quite radical and courageous stand taken by the client, who said it has to be a new typology. It cannot be a, a conventional shoebox hall, like our Auckland Town Hall, or the Music for Einstein, probably the most renowned acoustics in the world in Vienna. It can't be a, um, a vineyard-style hall, which is the Berlin Philharmonie, shown there. It can't be an arena style, like Christchurch Town Hall. So it had to be something new. So 
three weeks into the 10-week prog program arrive, the, uh, Sir Harold and I arrived in, in Paris. We, uh, I arrived on the Sunday and rolled into Jean Nouvel's office on Monday morning. And Jean Nouvel, uh, we were informed, was in hospital on his back, undergoing a back operation. And so this, for us, was a disaster. They said, never mind, he's done the concept design. <laughs> so, <clears throat> now, it, it always brings a laugh when I uh, show that slide, but, uh, slide, but there, there are a number of things, and I'm going to show you li a slide later on that shows that the design is actually relatively true to this initial concept. What he was on about here was that the park was going to flow underneath the building and here there were some ramps leading up to the building and people from the park were going to be able to walk on top of the building and interact with the building in an external manner as well as an internal manner. Now, um, as you'll see here, um, there is some similarity to that uh, original just concept sketch to the, the final building form here, and I'll show a couple of others later on. So we went ahead anyway, met with there are a number of architects obviously on the team, and this was another of his concept sketches that we set off working with, with a number of CAD guys and very creative people. One of the things I mentioned that we're renowned for is our innovative design. And when I say our, it's primarily my partner, Sir Harold, original founding partner, Sir Harold Marshall. Being an architect from the School of Architecture for many years and whatever, he has an amazing ability to work collaboratively with architects and create new designs by using acoustical elements but coming up with a, a new concept. And this is a photocopy of a serviette that he worked on with me over breakfast. And what you can see here is a form. Just look at this part of it, because there's, there's four things that are separate diagrams that are here. Just look at this top one here. And we've got a cross section through a hall. The outer volume is up here, and it runs off the edge of the serviette onto the cloth table cloth at this stage. And here are a series of suspended reflectors going in here. And here we have various seating layers um, hanging around. Here we have an asymmetrical concept of um, splitting the hall, and uh, it's a concept that Harold has been very keen on for a, a number of years and are in a number of our halls that we've designed. And here are some of the seating plans um, that tended to be uh, and turned out to be floating chambers. Harold and I took this sketch to Jean Nouvel, and then the whole design process that I mentioned, the collaborative approach rather than prescriptive approach, of, approach started working. And um, uh, Jean Nouvel tends to do most of his work over lunch with um, a couple of glasses of wine, and it helps the creative juices um, get going. And an amazing architect to work with, really outstanding. And he and Harold formed a, a, a really terrific relationship. So. Here's a 3D printed model that came out at the end of this 10-week process that shows the, the concept that really Harold had come up with on that serviette, which is two nested chambers. An, an outer chamber that is 70% bigger than Christchurch Town Hall and most other concert halls of 2,400 seats, and then uh, a series of inner floating seating pods that are formed with other acoustical elements, these what we call nuages or clouds that float around and form this inner volume to uh, give great um, clarity. So we have an outer volume that provides us with acoustical presence and it's got its own acoustical presence and reverberance and the audience walks in over these bridges and into the seating pods and then we have this inner volume which is providing visual and acoustical intimacy between the, uh, the performers and the audience. So a completely, completely new concept to uh, the theory of concert hall design. So the competition submission was uh, very interesting, as well as all that documentation that I mentioned. The 
the French were very prescriptive, and I think this is actually a good way to go about a design competition in what you had to and what you were allowed to submit. It was, it was tightly restricted to five A0 drawings, four A4 pages of text, two for the architect, one for us, um, and you had to produce an exterior model, an interior model, and a two-minute video. So uh, this is the two-minute video that was produced after really a seven-week design program because, as I mentioned, we arrived there uh, with, uh, after three weeks. So if we could set that one going. So I, I think a pretty we, we had nothing to do with the, com the computer rendering and the video, but a pretty impressive effort after uh, basically seven weeks. So um, we hung on tender hooks for uh, for two months, and then suddenly this came out. Next video, if you could click on that. <laughs> A New Zealand company is part of the team which has won a competition to design Paris's new concert hall. 97 international teams vied to win the right to design the $400 million Philharmonic de Paris, which is widely tipped to be one of the most significant cultural buildings built this century. So that one goes on a bit longer, but that's... Um, so we had an ecstatic Easter and, of course, um, we're highly delighted to... Uh, uh, win this amazing project with the, with the team. So the detailed design process then went, basically went on for, for three years and uh, there's a huge uh, amount that goes into the design of a concert hall like this, of course. And I've, to trim this down, as I mentioned before, I've had to strip a lot of that out. But uh, one of the things I just w would like to show you is, uh, again, a highly innovative technique that we developed in the, for the design of this concert hall. One of the, the problems with surround halls, as I mentioned, is that they, they don't have inherently what we call lateral reflections. Now, just to very quickly explain what lateral reflections are. Here we have a conventional shoebox um, concert hall in bird's eye view, in plan view for the architects. And we've got a stage and an audience. When you're sitting in that, you hear the direct sound comes from the orchestra to you, but you also hear reflections that come off the side walls. And suddenly, you've got a stereo image with uh, a broadening of the source and a wonderful feeling of envelopment. When you, in the 1960s, the Americans found that 1,800 seats was non-economic. So you couldn't put people further away because they'd be getting too far away from the stage. So they just created a fan shape and just expanded the walls. So what happens when you expand the walls is that the reflections now go down the side walls and there's this huge area in the middle that's completely devoid of lateral reflections. 
And this was basically what Sir Harold dis discovered in the 1960s, what his research was all about and uh, got him onto the world stage. So in a surround hall, you've got the same problem. They're not inherently provided by the walls of the room. So you can see here, this is our surround hall. This is the, um, the competition winning design. And there's a number of surfaces I mentioned around here that uh, the nuages and all sorts of things that look possibly look arbitrary. And I assure you there's no arbitrary surfaces in this room. What we went through in the design, detailed design process was optimizing all these surfaces to provide reflections from the appropriate direction at the appropriate time interval. So here you can see a technique that one of my colleagues developed to uh, manipulate. Sorry, I'll come back to that. And we started off with a cardboard model, uh, 1 to 50 scale cardboard model with a laser and mirrors and got some initial ideas on outer surfaces. Then we moved into the 3D uh, computer drawings provided by the architect. The architects in Europe tend to use Rhino. And my colleague, one of my young colleagues, developed this plug-in tool which enabled us to project the sound onto each of these uh, unusual surfaces and predict where it was going. And so he was able to map out um, each of these surfaces and get um, the appropriate coverage into all those areas. Now, that looked extremely simple and whatever, and we would, we would go through that process and we'd send it off to the architect and they say, no, we don't like that bit, we want to tweak it here. So then he'd have to go through it all over again and start again. It was an amazing iterative process that was done uh, v basically via the internet, and, uh, but couldn't have been done without this tool that my colleague developed. So after the detailed design phase, we went <coughs> at, uh, it basically got costed at the end of that, and the price came out at three times the budget. It uh, was just after the GFC, and so uh, it went into a two-year hibernation process. Um, so after significant lies and corruption and splitting the budget from here to there and um, other things, significant negotiations with the builder, and uh, a new government, 2011, it was all go. So, the, it was all heading for, a, I think it was originally January 2014 was the supposed opening date. That was later de delayed to the middle of 2014. And then, finally, uh, it was delayed to the 14th of January 2015, and that was absolutely fixed in stone. They said they were unmovable. So we were meant to do a pile of commissioning measurements before it, it opened, and we had information that it wasn't anywhere near complete. The architect was extremely unhappy at the state of the building. Uh, so I sent my French-speaking colleague um, over, and he arrived on the 12th of December, and with his program heading for the 14th of January for the, for the grand opening. And this is the state of the room uh, when he arrived on the 12th of December. And you can see that basically it's an absolute mess. I think there were a hundred seats installed, and uh, it just there's no way that he thought it was going to be ready. They, I think, they had a two two day break for Christmas, and then they started with uh, basically at all times, 24 hours a day. They had 200 people um, inside the building uh, working 24 hours a day. I arrived on the 4th of January uh, with 10 days to go and you can see the sort of publicity that was uh, around about the opening. These were the overture opening signs. Um, these ones on the right were in the subway and these were out on the streets. And <coughs> this was the state of the room when I arrived. So that's actually in the concert hall. That timber on the right here, is, that's the stage. These are some of the, where some of the seats are going to go. This is one of the facades of those major reflectors. It's just um, blank plywood. It was uh, an absolute mess. I had a debrief with my colleague who'd been there for, for two weeks, and he said that we were under extreme pressure from Jean Nouvel to boycott the opening, that Jean Nouvel was going to boycott because of the terrible state the building was in. We were not allowed to talk to the client, the, the Philharmonie de Paris. We were not, he said we were not allowed to talk to the press and they wanted us to fail the acoustic details to prevent uh, it from opening. 
So we were in a real dilemma here. So I, I called our lawyer. We'd had a French lawyer involved uh, at the start when negotiating the contract. And unfortunately, he was hospitalised as well. So, so uh, he'd had a kiteboarding crash, which I uh, had some sympathy for, having just spent the summer kiteboarding. So the um, <coughs> two days later, then uh, the shocking events of the 7th of January happened. And um, this photo is taken in the Charlie Hebdo office is this door here, and three metres behind my back from where I took that photograph was the hotel that we were based in. And we luckily weren't in the hotel at the time, we were 700 metres up the road in a friend's apartment, and we heard all the sirens and whatever, and had to call for my colleague's wife who was in the building, and it was just um, a horrible experience and an incredible place to be uh, at the time. And I'll come back a bit, little bit more to that in a second. The whole of Paris was... Uh, we, we couldn't get to the site that day because the terrorists fled to uh, Port de Pantin where they um, lived and it was the police, police were all over the site. So anyway, it's, um, two days later, here we are, another shot of four days to go to the, um, the opening. Um, the place is still a, a mess. However, there was one shining light um, in amongst this chaos. I mean, we had a number of things in the design that hadn't been implemented. They were minor things, but we were, as you always, building up to these things, extremely worried about how this um, room was going to perform. And I sat down in the, in the, in the very uppermost balcony, and I'd never realised they were going to finish a lot of the, the reflecting surfaces in this high gloss as they had done. And suddenly I saw this reflection, which if I go back to the previous slide, this, this is the overstage reflector, which is normally at um, about 12 to 14 metres above the stage. They'd lowered it down onto the stage for maintenance. It had this bright fluorescent light on it. And here was the reflection of the light of the whole stage in this, in this reflector. And in the nuages, there was just light reflecting everywhere. And I just instantly knew, it was an absolute light bulb moment. I knew this thing was going to be a huge success. So it was just a breakthrough in amongst all the other. Then, on the, uh, with three days to go of opening, there was the March of Solidarity, uh, Solidarity. And you will all have remembered seeing that in the news. I had this great friend who had an apartment on Boulevard Voltaire. And uh, this was the most well-organised march I've, I've ever seen in my life. There were two million people went along Boulevard Voltaire. Um, each wave was headed by these um, policemen, um, completely calm, completely relaxed, everybody in an amazing state. And this is the view from the apartment, uh, looking up to Les, Re Les Republiques and heading for National down the other end, if you could hit that video as well. Um, this is one of the most moving experiences of my life. It still makes the hair stand up in the back of my neck. These people, um, everybody singing as they came past. So yeah, absolutely, incredibly moving experience. So then the Monday was the Hard Hat Concert. And to explain, the Hard Hat Concert is the opportunity for all the people that worked on the building to, they have a free concert, the orchestra has the chance to try out the hall, and we have a chance to listen to the acoustics and measure the acoustics when it's occupied. So this is the state of the room still for the Hard Hat Concert. So we've still got scaffolding inside the room, um, and uh, but uh, al almost there, Jean Nouvel decided he would come to the hard hat concert, but he was still boycotting the opening, and gave an impassioned speech 
um, this is the president of the Philharmonie and the CEO of the orchestra, and gave an impassioned speech. Um, and I understand where he was coming from, of why he felt it shouldn't be opened. I had the terribly awkward experience of sitting next to him for the concert. <laughs> and after the, uh, after the first um, piece of music, um, he said, what do you think it sounds like? And um, I sure as hell wasn't going to say terrible, but um, there were, unfortunately, a couple of little image shifts that were coming off some surfaces that hadn't been uh, tidied up at that stage. But basically, it was amazing. I, one, of my, one of my colleagues who was in our team there for the commissioning measurements is um, from our Melbourne office, who is previously the concert master for the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. So he's one of the top five violinists in Australia. And he decided he preferred... Uh, doing acoustics and designing auditoria with us uh, many years ago. And I, he'd been sitting in the audience and I immediately asked him, because uh, his opinion was so much more valuable than mine, and, and he was just over the moon. So uh, ev the clients were, was over the moon, everybody. We went backstage um, for champagne. And, but possibly the greatest moment of my uh, professional career was this chap on the left um, came up to me. We'd met him beforehand. Um, he was the principal bassist in the orchestra. And he came up and hugged me and he said, I heard angels, thank you. And uh, it was just um, absolutely amazing. So that was the hard hat concert. Then we uh, moved on to opening night. Continued pressure from Jean Nouvelle. We hadn't got given him a definite answer. We had this incredibly difficult decision. But we said, we understand where you're coming from, but commissioning includes testing and we uh, includes listening. And we have to be there as well as test. And we have to be there and listen. So uh, we decided to go. Uh, in one of the rehearsal rooms, um, half an hour before the concert, there was a speech given by President Francois Hollande and the Mayor of Paris and uh, the President of the Philharmonie. And immediately after that speech, we were very fortunate to get introduced to uh, the President, uh, President Hollande. Um, we uh, obviously know the, the, uh, the client very well. But um, So here's a short, a, a short clip of the opening performance taken from the television coverage on the evening, if we could hit that video. You can see there one of the techniques that Jean Nouvelle loves to use is lighting. A lot of the other slides, the building is orange on the inside, and that's why I had this white, initially looking very bland um, exterior of the or surface of the outer volume. Um, but it was so he could do that, uh, th those lighting effects. One of the pieces they played at the opening concert was the Foray Requiem, which they dedicated to the victims of the Charlie Hebdo um, shoot shootings and uh, that also was uh, amazingly moving. So here are just a couple of quick photos. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the outer volume. Here's the audience walking in over these bridges into the inner volume. Still some unfinished scaffolding on opening night. Um, but inside, it wasn't, once you're inside the room, it wasn't really visible other than this, this one little defect down here which you wouldn't know. Um, so acoustically, it was, uh, it was 99% complete and um, an absolutely stunning room. So the outcome overall, 
Um, the external architecture, apart from uh, the, even the unfinished nature in terms of it being controversial in terms uh, of John Novell's opinion, the other architectural opinion is, is split. Uh, it's highly controversial. The, um, some people think it looks like a, a crashed spaceship and aluminium um, uh, elements that have just landed. And uh, other people say it's, uh, think it's brutal. And these birds, um, as you saw in the video, there's these birds all over the facade, which uh, relate to the park. Um, and that's the motif that flows over the area and some of the under areas. But in my personal opinion is I actually really like the external. Um, I think it fits in with the park and the follies and the un nat unusual nature of the park. And I think it's, it's stunning. Just very briefly on the aluminium, um, issue for the facade. I was sitting in an early design meeting with uh, the full team. It was all going on in French and I wasn't understanding a word until the project architect was sitting beside me and she, and she said, oh my God, oh my God, in English. And so I couldn't ask her at the time. I walked out of the meeting and I said, what was the oh my God about? And she said, well, the quantities of A had just added up, had just costed the aluminium for the facade, which at that stage was something like 30 millimetres thick, multiplied it by the total area of the room, divided by the cost of aluminium, and the, just the aluminium cost was more than the total budget of the project. <laughs> so, <coughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, in terms of the outcome, the internal architecture, I think it's absolutely stunning. Uh, and the, all the other opinions seem to agree with that, just moving around our acoustic reflectors floating in space, and um, it's an incredible room. The adaptability that I mentioned has, has worked. Here's a few of the different functions that they've had already for set up for rock concerts and world music and jazz, and it really has worked in terms of bringing p music to the people. They've, they had 270 concerts between January and June, uh, 312,000 tickets sold, and it's an amazing costing procedure. If you get in, I mean, the difference between the, the best and the worst seat is between 98% and 100% um, in terms of outstanding acoustics and whatever. It's amazing all through it. And, but they have these $10 seats uh, available, so they sell months and months um, ahead. There's 60% um, of the audiences have been new symphony audiences that haven't been before. As I mentioned, sold out. I tried to book for a Beethoven concert in November this year, um, two, months, two months ago, a month ago I tried to book, and it was down to 10 seats left. I was able to get a seat, but there were only 10 out of 2,400 with three months to go. So, and it has these amazing, uh, they've had several great open days where the people have swarmed um, to the building and all over it, which is, that is one of. The outcome in terms of the acoustics, and the, we've been really overwhelmed by the, uh, by the reviews. There was a, a press gallery of 60 journalists that I faced from all over the world uh, on the day before, on the day of the opening. And... Uh, this is uh, one of the, from the New York Times, and uh, which is obviously uh, we were very pleased about. And then one of the very early ones from Tom Service of the of the Guardian, and uh, he spoke very favourably. I won't read that out. I'll let you wander through it. So. Got two very short video clips. How are we going time wise, Alex? This is really coming to the end. We Great. Okay. We'll hit this video and I'll, I'll stop it after a, um, about 20 seconds. Pabou Yarvi, comment vous pourriez caractériser le son que tout le monde attend? Quel est cet appareil? I'll tell you, I almost had a sleepless night the uh, night before because I really worried and was very anxious about about the, the, the most, for me, the most important thing, and it's the acoustics, it's the sound of the whole. I can tell you, be the first one to report to you, that it is a huge success. The sound is warm, there is enough reverb, it's not too reverberant, most importantly, it's not dry, and it has darker colors, 
we did a variety of uh, repertoire. Okay, we'll move, move on. He goes on for another minute. This next one is uh, Sir Simon Rattle, who is the world's preeminent conductor at the moment. He conducts the Berlin Philharmonic, and we've just got a short video clip of him. They obviously played there about um, four months ago. For years, all of us around the world were looking at what was happening in Paris, wondering what the Philharmonie would be. And you have to understand, for musicians and orchestras, we have our instruments, we have our single violins, we have our whole orchestra, whatever. But the mega instrument we play in is the concert hall. And you can imagine the joy of the Berlin Philharmonic and myself on tour, uh, going and playing one of the very early concerts in the Philharmonie in Paris and realizing that this is one of the world's greatest acoustics. It was clear that not everything was completely finished uh, at this time, but even then one can see that we've been given one of the greatest joys a musician can have, which is a truly great acoustic to work in. That's a good note to finish on. So, so just finishing off, the outcome in terms of the architecture, and one of the things I've been really impressed with, that it's been true to the original concept, those sketches, and true to the competition design. So here is some of those original sketches, and here it is developing um, so I'll just go back and start that again. So we're starting with this sketch. Here's, here's it melding into the exterior model from the competition. And here it is melding into the actual finally complete um, building. So really remarkably true to that competition design. So the exterior as well. This is the computer rendition of the exterior and there's the final building. Well, not the final building, the January almost complete building. And so in conclusion, uh, in my opinion, it's a magnificent public building. It's, um, brought, it's achieved its goal of bringing the music to the people and bringing new people to music. And one of the, when talking with my colleagues about the relevance of um, this project to sustainability, and Alex has mentioned a number of them, but also one of the big ones is there have been a number of concert halls around the world that have basically been demolished and rebuilt because of their poor acoustics. And so we're hoping that this um, initial fantastic reaction means that will never happen to this building. So um, that's, that's the finale, and we could finish off with 20 seconds of the Marshall Day Band uh, just to wake everybody up, if you like. Here we go. Hit it. There you go. Thank you very much. That was fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, thank you, Chris. What a, what a tour de force. That was amazing. Right, gosh, well, look, I'd like to... Um, I think that was, just, that was pitched perfectly, wasn't it? Um, just in Architecture Week, you know, just a real example of, of what architecture can do. And um, I, I love that. That was brilliant. Um, I didn't... One question, I, didn't, I don't know you from before, Chris, but did you have grey hair before you started the project? I'd got a lot grayer, yeah. I tell you. It was yeah. incredible, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, so, look, I'd like to invite the panellists to the stage and, and Chris and everyone to come back up and uh, as they get settled and grab a bit of breath of air. Um, as they come up, perhaps I'll introduce them and then we'll get the, uh, the conversation um, going. So, Alex, would you like to join me up on the stage? And, and where's Patrick and, uh, and Ro? So, OK, we'll just... Um, as we get moving... Um, Firstly, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Patrick Clifford, who's uh, on the left here. Uh, Patrick Clifford is the uh, director of Architectus. Um, Patrick and his firm are really well known around the, the world of architecture, in particular in Auckland. He's a former president of the NZIA, um, taught at the Auckland University as well, the School of Architecture, as a, mem a member of the Auckland Urban Design Panel, 
and has served as president of the New Zealand Institute of Architects. Uh, so it's uh, just wonderful to have you here, Patrick. And also, um, you know, it's been ordered the, world, the, the gold medal for lifetime achievement from the NZIA. So uh, it's thrilling to have you here, Patrick. So as we move down the, the, the row, Patrick, I wouldn't mind you sort of having contemplating what, what you've just heard and um, how we might apply this sort of the story we've heard here to Auckland. What can we learn from, from Chris and what can we learn from the story that we've just heard? It's a bit of a Victor Hugo and a, a bit of a Dan Brown all mixed into one, but, but you know, what, what, can, what can this tell us? Um, so if you wouldn't mind thinking about that. Um, next up, um, we've heard, obviously heard from Chris. Um, Alex, I've introduced already. Um, on the far right, so your left, is uh, Ro Hoskins. Ro is the director of uh, Design Tribe Architects. Um, Ro has been working very closely with us for some time, but he has over uh, 20 years of experience working with the Māori community-based um, design projects. Um, he has, for the past 15 years, specialised in the design of Māori educational institutions in the wider Auckland area. Um, he's also worked extensively as an urban and cultural design consultant, as well as an iwi liaison capacities um, consultant on a range of large uh, public projects. Um, Ro is a co-opted member of the Housing New Zealand Māori Capability Committee and remains active in Māori housing advocacy and papakaenga design projects. Uh, Ro has been uh, assisting my team in particular developing up what we are calling tiaranga design principles. And uh, Ro, as we um, perhaps have a reflection from Alex around uh, what we've just heard, uh, perhaps if you go first, Alex. But Ro, I'd love you to think a bit about how tiaranga design can be manifested in the conversations we are having today around our city, and perhaps you would touch upon why actually tiaranga design principles are and what they mean so everybody understands uh, what we're talking about. So, Alex, do you, do you mind going first and so perhaps reflecting on what you've just heard? You obviously know Chris w well, but you know, how's, how's the state of, of sort of New Zealand green building architecture and sort of architecture in general in your, in your world? Sure. Um, so... Um, just particularly about the building in Paris. I mean, I, I um, um, you can tell that I'm British or European, half German, uh, and I'm taking my children back home for Christmas. And I, I've already said to my partner, we're going to Paris. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't quite, I didn't realise that they got booked out quite that fast. So I need to get my bumming gear, really, don't I? Yep. Um, <clears throat> amazing. Yeah. Utterly amazing. I mean, I remember when 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 we were talking and you were describing what had happened and you were describing the acoustics. Um, and, and I just felt straight away that actually we ought to tell more people about it. So, so clearly more people wanted to know. Um, in terms of, of, of the sustainability side of things uh, and how, how acoustics are really important to that, I mean, I, I'm quite excited because we have the Auckland Theatre Company. So, you know, you're applying your great expertise to that as well. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not entirely sure if it's going to be quite as dramatic as that, um, but I hope so. Um, I, think that, I think that we have a number of great projects that have happened in New Zealand uh, in the sustainability yeah. space more generally. Um, and I find that quite exciting. You know, if I think about you know, the Geyser building in Parnell and I think about the Christchurch Civic building, um, I think we've lost our mojo a little bit. I think we're a little bit... We, need to, we, we are regaining our mojo, but we have to go a bit further. I think we've been treading water for a while on the, on the sustainability front. Um, and actually, it's really, it's really critical that we speed up again. Um, and so I, I feel that the, that the movement that, that we're all contributing to yep. is actually really incredibly important and that we need to accelerate it. Do you, so. do you think, um, this is maybe a reflection for the team, but, but you know, is this not something that New Zealand needs to lead the world rather than sort of follow? Um, we're the, sort of the first city in the world to wake up on a new day and this idea of, of sustainability and, mm. and architecture and city building that mm. actually could take us and the world could learn a little bit from us. Um, so I guess it's a, an op maybe a, a, a question to you, Patrick, and, and what do you think about that? Well, look, I think um, the sustainability question is a pretty broad one. I mean, where do we get our energy from in the first place? I mean, we do a lot of things very well here that... Um, I think are as important as to the way in which we measure buildings. So, I mean, I think it's a pretty broad topic, but I would quite like to go back to your first question. Sure. And what, what might we take from um, 
Chris's talk, and I think one you can take that the architect can behave however they feel and um, achieve a wonderful outcome and live, look to me like live a pretty good life. You know, it <laughs> seemed, seemed to me that this was a um, great advertisement for getting up late, for having a long lunch, <laughs> and um, being wonderfully successful and creative. But maybe, maybe more seriously, I thought the, the pictures of Paris. I mean, architecture deal, deals a lot with the particular, which is the concert hall. It deals with the special places where our lives are enacted and framed, in places of worship, uh, in places of celebration, in places where we're ill, where we're you know in need of care, and, and all, all of those things. And it also deals with the ordinary. And um, I thought those pictures of of the streets of Paris are about the kind of backdrop, you know, those beautiful apartment buildings, those beautiful streets, and the concert hall's about the particular. And in New Zealand, we have all of those challenges, but maybe most of all, we have the challenge of the ordinary, the challenge to make sure and to endeavour to make great housing, to make great streets, and to build a great city. And um, then I've got a feeling that the kind of particularities um, are the sort of opportunities that come on once in a while. Mm. But if you look after yeah. the ordinary, then you have an opportunity to do something much more with the extraordinary. Mm. So I, I really enjoyed that that kind of um, right. that, that imagery that came with that. So perhaps bringing in Roe into that. Thank you, Patrick. That was good. I mean, really interesting. I mean, I guess the ordinary and the extraordinary, um, our culture, our DNA. Uh, what is the story we want to tell? In our city, I, I, I'm old, often told about Māori people wanting to see their faces in the city mm. and feeling at home in our city. And I, I guess that's where architecture, design, landscape has to play a part. What, would you mind just sort of expanding on, on that a little bit? Yeah, it r reminded me of <clears throat> some lectures that we had from Harold Marshall um, when I was at architecture school in the, in the 80s while this building was being built. And I remember Harold Marshall... Um, saying in a lecture that um, they'd provided some advice to the designers here and, and that advice had been ignored. And um, so, you know, it was, it's interesting to be taken right back to that period and to be here tonight and also to reflect on the uh, criticism, I guess, that the Altair Centre um, had during its, you know, gestation, um, not just its acoustics, but... Um, I guess the point that I, I really would like to refer to is the issue of identity and, and yeah. buildings such as the, the Paris Philharmonie and the Altair Centre have the opportunity to, to really reinforce a sense of identity and distinctiveness. And that's what, we'd, that's what from a Māori perspective, we're looking for. We're looking for the particular. We're looking for those particular nuances which speak back to us. Um, some of the earlier slides um, showing the partial reinstatement of Te Wai Horo Chu, the, the original stream or, or turn into a creek further down Queen Street. And the, the opportunity just to bring even a part of that back to life <coughs> in this precinct, to me, is very, very important. And we've been working with Mana Whenua, uh, the 13 um, tribes of the uh, central, um, the Isthmus, um, on um, large-scale projects such as Altair Framework and Waterfront Auckland projects, and, and talking to them about what are the particular aspects of those design opportunities which are going to be meaningful for them. And so those te Aranga principles which are referenced in the Aotea framework, um, Aotea quarter framework, uh, really are just a, a, a mechanism for trying to make sure that there, there's an engagement between mana whenua, the client group, in this case the council or, or one of the council CCOs, um, and the design community, Māori or non-Māori, and just uh, providing a, a framework by which that co those conversations can take place. Um, okay. So that if we were to design an Aotea Centre again, um, there may be a series of other uh, perspectives applied to the design brief, and probably most importantly that the, um, the original treaty signatories and, and, and the tribes that brought Hobson to Auckland in 1840 um, and um, said about the genesis of the city that those tribes will take their rightful place in those important civic conversations, those important urban design conversations. So, as you mentioned, that we can see our, our faces in our places. Okay. Fantastic. Does, um, yeah, there you go, Chris. Ludo, have, if have I could just go. take up on one thing that Rose started off with there, in this building we're in, <coughs> it's... 
reminded me of the times when you mentioned that because I first started working with Harold back then when this was being designed and it's a, and it's a really example of how important great architects are because we would come down and the city architect, and I don't want to sound too critical here, um, um, but the city, we, we'd have a meeting with the city architect and Harold would come up with these amazingly radical ideas. We had a, for this um, auditorium, the ASB auditorium, we had this incredibly radical asymmetrical hall that was just all over the place. Amazing. And it was, in, it was incredible. And the, uh, the architect would get really fired up and say, yeah, yeah, I'll draw that. Six months later, he'd call me. He was too scared to talk to Harold. He'd phone me up and say, look, can you come down and have a look at this? I, I haven't really been able to get it to work. But you know, so I'd grab Harold and we'd go down again and, and it was all gone back to symmetry and whatever. And then we'd have another inspirational meeting, get it all going and it will go all over the place. And then six months later, get the call. That went on for four years or something rather like that. As oh. against these great architects. <laughs> That's right. Who... <laughs> too scared to phone you. <laughs> 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 who take the ideas that um, Harold can come up with and, and we now have developed as well, can come up with these acoustical ideas and turn it into, into great ar architecture by building off those ideas and creating fantastic buildings rather than, rather than ordinary buildings. And that's mm. just so, so important. So what are the skill sets that you need as a great architect? What, what, is, what, is, the, what is the fundamentals here? Because... Yeah, I mean, well, I, I I'd think be what, to what both Ro and, and Chris are talking about is, is sort of synthesis. The idea that you can take an abstract concept and make it and, and make it manifest, right? So, so what I think is really important, the tier of principles, is the fact they have been elaborated and now everyone can share in those, mm. understand what they are, and begin to. It's a it's a sort of a doorway into mm. this practice because it enables you to then. Think, think about how you might develop those and apply them, just like the conversation about acoustics, um, you know, the, the shape or the, um, the qualities that it might have trigger uh, ways in which architecture can make that manifest. I mean, so I think architecture, the skills one looks for is our associative skills. I can associate this with that. I can take that acoustic thing, idea that Harold drew on his napkin and... Uh, Jean Duvel can say, I can make this space out of that. Yep. And that seems to me the partnership mm -hmm. that happens in design, that one yep. conversation leads to another. And I think that's yep. what's really important with mm -hmm. what's Absolutely. happening. Perhaps for the first time, the, the ability to actually describe those principles. Mm. And, and having those mandated them. conversations. You know, I think for a long time we had a mana fender on the outside yeah. um, trying to get inside and sit around that table and... Um, yeah, I have to say the last two or three years that, that opportunity has really been picked up by the council and and in general, despite the number of different mana whenua groups involved, there's generally a very um, uh, collegial process um, whereby yeah, the architects, the, the design community, landscape architects, um, urban designers can can have those associative conversations and 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 to to help them in their design processes, yeah. I don't, not that I want to take the take it away from architecture, but I, but I think that this is a it's a it's a growing sophistication, moving away from consultation to engagement. Mm. You know, where you're not just you're consulting somebody for the sake of consulting somebody to engaging and mm. and valuing and respecting mm. what it is that they are contributing to the conversation. And I think okay. I think we need to see more of that generally. And and you know, one of the things that I was thinking about earlier on in terms of you know one of the questions that I was asked was around community and sustainable community and how you create the kind of city that it is that we're looking for. And, it, and it, it's partly about the collaboration and people's involvement in the creation of those ideas. Um, yeah. And, yeah. I, yeah. Maybe that's really important too around this um, consultation about Aotea and what's it going to be. Because I don't think, it, it, to my mind, whether it, you know, there's some sort of higher level thinking I think is really important. Is it going to be, um, what, what's the nature of the place? Because we can, you know, the diagrams I think are all very sensible. It needs intensification, it needs some building around the edges. That's all good, but the question is what, is it, what, what are those things around the edges going to be? And mm. we think of the Paris example, it's a um, concert hall in a park. So we've got an AATS centre, is it a is it a park with a, with a hall in it? Is it the Barbican, which is a concert hall and some housing in amongst the city? Is it the Lincoln Centre, which is um, a concert hall and an educational institution of thriving um, sort of student 
centric place in the middle of the city. And it seems to me the vision has got to be about more than just the diagrams, and which are all very common sense. But what is it actually going to be like? What is the placemaking aspect of that? And I think if mm -hmm. a community of people can turn their minds to that, um, I think it's, that's, yeah. that's the kind of most important thing. So just we've had lots of goes at this. Yeah, I'm yeah, just thinking, uh, Vernon, is, um, is, his role is to be you know, eyes and ears on the ground with the public as mm -hmm. well. And I guess, what are, you, what are you picking up around the vision for Aetia? What is, w in terms of, do you want to just pop up here and just speak? I mean, have, have you been talking to people and what have they been saying? Yeah, at, at, this, at this quite early stage, of course, um, something that is coming through loud and clear is um, more sustainable modes of, of participating in a space and of, of getting to places. Actually, one thing I'd like to, to, to just touch on, because we mentioned sustainability, and it's, a, um, and it's a, to expand a bit beyond what you asked, it's, we often think of sustainability as purely an environmental thing, um, where, of course, true sustainability has, has social, cultural, economic, and environmental aspects. Um, and if we treat sustainability as simply being a, a synonym for, uh, you know, a green star rating or, um, you know, saving some rainwater or a green roof or whatever, I think we really miss out on the, the richness and the colour and the enormous potential of the concept, you know, which is, which is really meant to be. And certainly there's an enormously strong body of, of academic literature, which I happen to have studied in another capacity as a, uh, doing a Master of Laws in that area. Um, is that there, there is a complete and integrated philosophy and, and, um, and particularly the, the social and the cultural aspect, and that's a very big part of that. Not just consultation, not just a tick box exercise with, with iwi and, and, and all the people, you know, wherever they may be from, whether they're Tangata Whenua or people who, you know, the, the massive group of more recent immigrants that we have, genuine engagement uh, with those people um, in creating a space. So more specific to, to what you asked me though, um, the, the thing that has come through loud and clear, um, there are three that I would nominate. One is that people want a place to gather that is natural. So, so the, the, the term military parade ground has often come up, you know, and there've been many attempts to break up that space, to intervene somehow in a way that makes it um, a more natural place to spend time, and that's, that's an ongoing project, you know. And it's a challenging one, because when you have a big exposed place like that, um, you know, that has been so significantly uh, reinvented um, in quite recent times, and, uh, you know, then, then it's a real challenge to actually create that. It's not a historic square that things grew up around, it was created, uh, you know. So, so there's that. Um, the other thing is, of course, the dominance of the car, and it's less than it used to be in that area, of course. There used to be a big road down either side of the town hall, and it was sort of like the flat iron building in the middle of two major roads. Um, but uh, a, a thing that just comes out time and time again that we hear um, throughout the city, and particularly this area, um, is that the car is still way too dominant. Um, at the political level, um, you know, I and my colleagues certainly do everything we can to, to ensure that this doesn't become this stupid, unproductive dichotomy of cars versus everybody else, you know, we're not anti-car, etc., etc. You have to preface everything with that. Um, but what people really want, particularly living in the city, because who enjoys driving through the city? And it's a horrendous experience. Nobody really wants to do it. Um, but it is for a, a lack of better options, you know. So that is a thing that has come through extremely strongly, is that people want a place um, where they can spend time that's natural. Um, that was the first thing. And also, um, you know, where they can, where they can walk, um, cycle, whatever, you know, because there are a lot of people who don't feel safe walking or cycling through the spaces that we have, and they want us to provide better ones for them. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that's great. It just gives you a, there you go. Okay, so look, you've, you've heard from the sort of the four panellists, you've heard from Vernon, Does any, well, there's like probably about five minutes or so for a, a few questions from the floor. Would anyone like to ask anybody a question around anything you've heard tonight? Um, there's a lady in the front row and then there's a lady there. We'll probably go for those two. So after you, Lenny, does anyone, oh yeah, would you mind, there's a, there's a little microphone coming, Lenny, right behind you. Here we go. I'm intrigued um, as to what um, Jean Nouvel's current mood is on the subject of the philomony. Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I haven't checked up in the last month, but as of a month or two ago, he basically was 
um, in legal proceedings with the client um, in terms of saying that um, they weren't allowed to associate his name with the building unless 16 items which he identified were, were, rec were rectified. So at, at the moment um, he's going through that sort of quite an aggressive um, approach with the client to say my name's not associated, this is not my design. Um, I mean, you, you see it inside. I, I'm not sure if you've been to the Kebron League, which is another one of his designs and whatever, and they, these, um, they run out of budget and whatever. And you, I walked into that in the entranceway and I thought I'd come in the back door and I asked him about it. And it was because it had never been able to be finished. And so his architecture is really compromised in many ways. And the exterior of the building and some of the foyers uh, are really compromised from, from what he wanted. So he's taking that stand at the moment. Gosh, it sounds like the Sydney Opera House, isn't it? You can see sort of parallels. And, yes. Um, yeah, incredible. Uh, um, that's a great question. This lady, um, if you wouldn't mind, just in the yeah, second row. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great voice. Great acoustics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent voice. <laughs> Do it. Really excited to hear about that. Excellent. D that's a great question. Does anyone? I mean, I, I can answer just one thing, madam, is that we have a team uh, which we've been talking in the last sort of two, three months. Um, Water Waterfront Auckland, in particular, are leading the, this conversation around the need to think about climate change, in particular sea level rise. And there's an issue around the port. There's an issue around the waterfront. Um, it's less affected here up in the centre of the city, but actually the whole of downtown, what does that mean in terms of our central wharf? So we're working with the waterfront team around that conversation. There's a whole new sort of integrated team that's been set up. So that is a conversation that is happening and, and very very real and very relevant to our thoughts. Wasn't covered tonight, but that, that was just the, the way the, the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah. So does anybody else want to... I mean, so it's a big one, maybe we probably it is a big one. It. It is a big but one. it's a critical one, and of course, it's something to be taken very seriously. Hmm. So, um, uh, anybody else would like to make a comment? This, do, you want, do, you need, do you need a do you need a microphone? Here it comes. Thanks, it's for Chris. Um, I'm interested in the geometry of the clouds that you had hanging up in the ceiling of the Philharmonie. Um, does it perform better than flat surfaces, given the nature of the concave double curved surface? Yes, yeah, a very good question. One of the technical elements I had to drop out of the, um, my original chat to cut it down. But with a flat surface, is um, the sound reflects off it like light does off a mirror, and you get a what we call a specular reflection. So, if I shine a a laser beam onto a mirror, it'll come over to you and it'll still remain as a spot. If you then curve the surface, the sound will be spread out and, and diffused and into many more smaller rays of sound at a lower sound level. It still goes out and it goes in more directions. So what you get is a, a softer um, coverage. What you can get from single flat surfaces is an image shift. If you have a trumpet facing out to one of those reflectors, um, and you place, it can be too strong a reflection, and, you, and it sounds like the trumpet's actually playing out there. By curving it, you get a slightly weaker strength reflection that's more natural and more pleasing to the ear. So, well spotted, it's one of the, the, the significant um, acoustical elements in that design. So, is the sound quality substantially different? Um, a much higher quality, I mean? Or? It's, it's not hugely. I mean, the Christchurch Town Hall has all flat um, reflectors, and it's recognised as one of um, the top, uh, recently published top ten concert halls in the world, and Christchurch was in there. It's featured in every auditorium acoustics book written since 1970, and it's outstanding. It's got flat reflectors. 
Michael Fowler Centre, which was a uh, Mark II by Warren and Marnie, has um, diffusing reflectors in it, and um, they're both equally good. They're just um, slightly different. So um, it, it's 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 like good wine. Um, there's no right or wrong. Um, there's lots of ways of doing it in an excellent method. There, there, sorry, there is a right and wrong in in good and acoustics and bad acoustics. But on this particular issue, it's a subtle one that you can do it both ways. Thank you. Great. It's a great question. There isn't. I yeah. think it's uh, it's over it's over the head of some of us, but well, most of us. Yeah. But I think it'd be great for you guys to keep in touch, yeah. perhaps, and have a, another Very conversation. Um, look, but I mean, obviously we've had a, a panel here, and it's difficult to get everyone's views. But um, before we sort of ask Patrick to give the vote of thanks, I mean, would would any of you like to sort of give a a final sort of statement of, of any sort I mean what what are the messages for the council we're that we're we're the client for so many things what about a message to the the community of Auckland the the architectural communities what do we need to be thinking about as we construct and build our cities what about how about Chris could I make one slightly prov provocative suggestion along yeah. those lines yeah. that you would heard at the start I mentioned the fact that the Philomene had been planned to be in that location for 30 years um, for the first 20 years that I lived in Auckland, I, I didn't see a lot of vision of how this city was going to be in 30 years' time. Um, there's certainly a hell of a lot, been a hell of a lot more of that um, in the last five years. But they, they have a vision for those sorts of things, of where they're going to be, how they're going to be, how it fits in with the music precinct and that sort of stuff. And I think Auckland's heading down that track, but I think we can, we can do a hell of a lot better at um, planning further out where our stadia are going to be, what they're going to be, what the and what our major facilities are going to be, in amongst all the other things such as the waterfront and whatever. Great. Yeah. Anybody else oh, would like that? Thank I, you. Chris. I'm going to pick good. up on that because I was going to also talk about vision. I think that, um, uh, but it is a plea to, to community in that I think that um, I think we need more people to have a bit more of a discussion and debate about about the kind of city that we want. Um, you know, it's quite often that, that people, that, that council will put something up and people respond to it, but I actually think that there needs to be a bit more of a, a bit more of a citywide debate about what is the vision that we actually want, um, and, and, and it needs to be a collective vision. How do you buy into what is the kind of sustainable built environment that we want? I'm ho making an assumption that you want a bit of sustainability in it, but um, I, I think that there needs to be more conversation, because I also think that that would help to build a more collective perspective Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't get stuck into the, into the kind of nimbyism and, and the details of what people, you know, the details of what people do and don't want. I'm hoping that they would all buy into a bigger vision. And so I, I feel that if we had a, a bit more of a bigger conversation about what it could look like and, and, and be a bit more bold. Yeah, we d I mean, as a, as a member of the council, we, we desperately want more people to be involved in, mm. in developing and co-creating that vision. Mm. It's interesting, quite low levels of um, voting in, in cities and countries around the world. So it's very, yes, people want to be involved, yet they don't, they're often not as involved as they could be around the voting and actually nominating who you, who you want to be represented by. So there's a real issue around engagement uh, generally, and I suppose social media, all these opportunities are there to be seized upon, aren't they, to bring people into that conversation, to kind of co-create. So mm. it, we need better skill sets around that, mm. absolutely. But then you also need vision, so mm. it's trying to balance the two. Mm. You know, you know, in yeah. the old Versailles, Paris was, was designed by Napoleon. That was vision. But it yeah. wasn't about people vision; it was about armies. So, mm. you know, it wasn't a lot of consultation. Wasn't a lot of consultation. <laughs> Houseman. Houseman. Yeah. Houseman didn't do he a lot didn't of have consultation. A poll. <laughs> he didn't take a poll on that. So yeah, we so we try. So yeah, it's, it's a great point, though. Uh, Ro, how about you? Any any last thoughts? Uh, I'm I'm very optimistic with um, the general direction that that we're going in for the for CBD anyway, the the, the inner part of Auckland, and uh, I think that the in general the processes that the council um, family have adopted have been re uh, really positive and it, it's certainly engaged a much more um, mana whenua in those conversations so I, I look back uh, 20 years ago and um, we've lost a few um, good parts of, of Auckland but we probably gained in the last five years a lot more than we've lost so I think we're, we're heading generally heading in the right direction. That's great well, that's good good reflection thank you so look um, thank you Panelists, it's uh, always a difficult thing to, to manufacture and to manage, but I think thank you very much for your, your thoughts. I'll, I'll let uh, Patrick give the vote of thanks and uh, 
I'm to say goodnight. To, Luda, I'm supposed to be doing the thank yous. Yes. You're doing the thank you and the vote of thanks. Yes, indeed, that's right. So that's you, you're starting to thank everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, look, Ludo, firstly to you and to the city um, on an ongoing basis, I think the um, community that we're a part of appreciates the effort and um, emphasis and, and um, concentration that you have brought to these various events, these ones in particular. Uh, we'd like to also, as I'm here really talking on behalf of the Institute of Architects, we would like to thank the Green Building Council. Chris and Ro for joining the evening. We'd like to thank the sponsors, just to reiterate what you said earlier, and um, to repeat that there's plenty happening in the city. I think even something after this, um, we could go and have a few drinks and engage in some architectural dialogue and pleasure. So thank you. And indeed, oh, yeah. Out, mm. yes, I should have got you to do the thanks. Yeah, yeah, very, <laughs> very good.